we all come back. Amen. Uh, number 625, higher ground. Please stand. Number 625. We're going to do the first and the last verse. Thankful for 
for even our young people right now in the sound booth and behind those cameras. We thank God for you. This place would not be what it is without you. God bless you. Amen. And the Lord has blessed us with a young person that will be presenting our AY this afternoon. Isn't yes. that wonderful to see the Lord yes. using all of these young people? Amen. Oh, God, as we see youths taking their posts and doing the Lord's work. Amen. 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 Well, our presenter this afternoon is Armani Osborne, and she is a wife. She's a mother of two wonderful children. Um, Asher, who's five now, about to be five. He's four, going on five. And Abby, who's one. And um, recently, she graduated with her art degree. And so she has been doing some wonderful things for the Lord. And the Lord is calling her into ministry. She might share a little bit with us on that. But, Moni, we thank you so much for being willing, for accepting the invitation, and coming to be a blessing um, to us. She, her membership is at the Advent Hope SDA Church. And we thank God for our Advent Hope um, SDA family, don't we? They are always supporting us, Deborah, um, Brother Smith and family, and the rest of the church. They're always coming over supporting us. And when we go there, they treat us so well. So we thank God for Advent Hope. It is most of our second homes, amen? Sometimes when we're missing from here, we are there. So we thank God for them. Um, Mommy, I'd like to invite you now to come forward and um, give us what the Lord has given you. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for the invite. Um, it's really great that I can stand up here and be able to speak to you all and um, give you the knowledge and the research that I've done for myself. And I hope to, that it will be imparted to you um, and that it can be applied in your life and you can you know, give glory to God through it all. Um, just a little bit about what I'm trying to do. I'm not fully into it just yet, but I am have creating a ministry based on health. Um, of course, I can do pretty much anything but uh, in terms of presentations, but I'm stressing health, of course, because I graduated as a registered nurse, and my ministry is called Simply Health, My Health Made Simple, and my goal with that ministry is to just really um, reach other churches, whether they be Adventist churches or Sunday churches, and show them um, the right arm of the gospel, pretty much how the Lord wants us to live healthy lives. And honestly, a lot of times we think health to be a very complicated thing. Um, and so my goal is to actually show others that you can live healthy simply. And it's, it doesn't take a lot, you know, you still need to, of course, talk to your doctor, but you can take charge of your own health in simple ways. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and begin. Um, the title of my lecture today is, Does Media Affect Us? The Media and the Mind. So I would like
So while we're waiting, does anybody have a testimony they'd like to share? Way almost to the soul. And what you see and what you behold, you become. And so it's really important in anything that we do and anything that we look at that we pretty much decide if it's something that we should be looking at, if it's something even that we should be listening to. So though the text speaks more fully of the eye, if you think of it too, the, the ears as well, whatever we are listening to determines who we are. So Psalms 101.3, I mean 101 verse 3, I think we're having some trouble again. Just one second, I'm going to go ahead and read that verse. I will set, okay, thank you. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. And in um, Messages to Young People 285, those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. So in this text, we ultimately see that anything that is not written in the Bible that God says that we shouldn't look at that's impure, we can. Okay. 
Proverbs 23, 7. What a man thinks, so is he. So, we've all heard of this. Your thoughts become actions. Your actions become habit. Your habits become your character. And then your character becomes your destiny. So, ultimately what this is saying is what you watch, what you listen to, becomes your destiny. It is a lot more serious than what we originally thought. I know sometimes, um, and I'll talk a little later if we have time, I know that um, I have to stop at a certain time, but I want to speak a little to my testimony. If not, you know, feel free to invite me back if you all want to, but um, I found that before when it came to the media, I didn't look at it the way that how I look at it now when research. I found that um, we have a mindset where we feel it doesn't matter. It doesn't change who I am. But ultimately, your thoughts begin to change into those actions. So those things that you've been thinking, you'll find yourself acting upon sooner or later. So it's really important to start at our thoughts. Because if it's not of Christ, then ultimately, our actions and our character will not be of Christ. So in a world that's full of um, so much media, so much freedom to express yourself, why is there so much depression? Here, um, I don't know if I'm going to ask, you don't have to raise your hand, um, but I have been in the past a Netflix binger. I don't know if anyone has heard of that, but that's basically where you, you are just watching episode after episode after episode, and you say, okay, this is the last one, but then it's a cliffhanger, and then you're watching another one. And then before you know it, it's just, Four or five hours has passed. So, you know, you would think that you would be happy doing this, but it actually says here, I know it's kind of small, so I'm going to read it in your hearing. The most recent findings on binge watching associated people with binge on television with depression, loneliness, and an inability to control their behavior. Our findings in our research show that those who feel more depressed tend to watch more programs. A doctoral, um, Yo Hee Sung, a doctoral student at the University of Texas at Austin, and the lead researcher in the study, tells shots. So this is a article that is not religious at all. This is actually people in the world that are realizing that Netflix can and does have an association with depression. And that's not the only one. There's article after article after article simply stating that there is a link between depression and um, binge watching. Uh, of course, this could be binging really on anything. Now, here, um, it's not up there, but it's an article from Better, and listen to what they have to say. They say the chemicals being released in our brain is dopamine while we're watching our favorite television shows. This chemical gives the body a natural internal reward of pleasure that reinforces continued engagement in that activity. You should be, you should keep doing, sorry, one second. When you binge watch your favorite show, your brain is continually producing dopamine. Your body experiences a drug-like high. You experience a pseudo-addiction to the show because you develop cravings for dopamine. The neuronal pathways that cause heroin and sex addictions are the same as an addiction to binge watching. Your body does not discriminate against pleasure. It can become addicted to any activity or substance that consistently produces dopamine. So that's some big words there. Um, have you ever, it continues to say, have you ever felt sad after finishing a series? Mayer says that when we finish binge watching a series, we actually mourn the loss. This is called situational depression. Our brain stimulation is lowered, also known as depressed, such as in other forms of depression. And a study in the University of Toledo was um, 142 out of 408 reported higher levels of stress, anxiety, and depression than those who were not binge watchers. So, um, I have a little game that I'm going to do, um, and I'm going to pick some volunteers. Any takers? Okay, you two can come on. Any other takers? 
There you go. Okay, you can come up. You as well. You can come on up. Um, let's see, I'm going to take one more person. Oh, you want to take art? Come on up. Okay, so, oh, okay. So this is how this game works. I am going to have up here a series of lines. I want you to tell me which line matches with the first line, okay? So we're gonna answer in order. Um, you can just pass it down and we'll decide from there. All right, here's the first one. Which one does that match with? Three, okay, how about you? Okay, and you? Three. Uh-huh. Yeah, I would say three. Three. Okay, great. You are correct. That is the right answer. If you can pass it back down. And then we're going to go through this again. Again, same thing. Tell me, what does that match with?
Who were the people that died? The people who were in the restaurant. Why? Well, they interviewed a fireman, and what he said was, unfortunately, these people died because no one would get up to leave. And what basically happened is they, they're in this routine. You sit down, you tell the waiter your meal, then you get your meal, then you eat your meal, then you pay your bill, and then you leave. What happened was the people stayed because no one was there to pick up their bill. And they didn't want to be the only ones that got up and left. So after not very long, they all died because no one wanted to be the first one to get up and leave. So as crazy as that sounds, you know, oh, no, we never do that. Another experiment was done. Of course, this one, no fatalities, but um, I can't remember the, the channel that did it. But what they did is they tried to see if this will still happen in this time. They had a setup where they had random people filling out a survey, and they had one person that was the stooge um, basically fill out that survey, they gave them instructions. They wanted to see if the whole group of people in the building would leave um, or no, if that one person would leave and everyone else stayed. So what they found was, on average, 22 minutes would pass before the person would leave, which we all know by that time we would either die of smoke inhalation or the fire would consume us. So that really pointed a big picture for me because we look around and we decide who's doing what. And that's what he was trying to show in that, that in our brains, whether it's through how we were raised, the media that we're watching, the things that we're listening to, it does have an effect on us. So, again, we're talking about does it really affect me? There was a study done, it was very interesting, where they did um, a study in Italy on monkeys and peanuts. They wanted to try to see what's going on um, when the monkey touches the peanut. And all these things you can definitely look up to get more information. It's very interesting. Don't go down a rabbit hole, but I would say, yeah, definitely look it up. Um, but continuing on, um, brain researchers were working with the monkeys and they wanted to see what neurons would fire when they would pick up the peanut. So they pick up the peanut and they realize what's known as a mirror neuron, which is a brain cell um, that would fire every time the monkey would pick up the neuron, I mean, pick up the peanut. And so it was an interesting find, but then one day by accident, um, scientists walked in, he picked up the peanut and he found something very interesting happened. The monkey's mirror neuron fired. So he found that not only did the monkey not move, but he saw it and his mirror neuron still, in a sense, activated so that it was as if the monkey was doing it himself. So that actually tells us that our brains, we may know the difference, but our brains don't really notice the difference between seeing and doing. So Satan understands this. He understands that if he can get you to do nothing about what you're listening to, about what you're watching, and you can think nothing will happen, ultimately, he has your mind. And as much as we think that our mind will do the things that you know we feel will happen later on in the end times when the crisis comes, we don't know what our mind will do. What we know is that Christ has given us a warning to be careful what we put into ourselves. So that monkey at um, experiment was a very interesting find. So the question can be now, can I do can't I do both? Amos 3.3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Satan takes control of every mind that is not decidedly under the control of the Spirit of God. Thessalonians and Ministry 79. So that tells us two things. You have to choose one or the other. You cannot even not choose. So in understanding all of these things, we have to really advise ourselves. Do we want to find ourselves promoting, ultimately, the Sunday law? Or do we want to find ourselves running and believing in God and trusting in God so that we can make it in heaven with Him? So I have...
here, the Stanford Prison Experiment. Anyone heard of that one? Oh, you have. Okay. So we have one person. So I'm going to try my best to summarize it. Um, ultimately, they wanted to experiment on the nature of man. So as God told us, the carnal nature is enemy with God. We know carnal nature was ultimately can do the worst of worst. But for ourselves, we never think of ourselves to do anything bad, whether we're a Christian or the normal day-to-day -day person. So in this experiment, they wanted to test something out. So we have here, I can get it. this here is the prisoner and this is the guard. These are all volunteers. Now, unfortunately, back in the day, these times, they didn't really adhere to ethics. So a lot of times, people didn't know what was going on. So they actually didn't know exactly how things were going to go, especially the prisoner votes. To summarize it quickly, basically, they got some um, volunteers. They um, told them, you know, whether you stay or leave, just you coming is enough for you to get the money, because of course it was a paid one. Um, but they didn't want them to feel they had to stay. So they say, just you showing up is enough, you can get paid for it. They told certain people who will be the guards, and they told certain people who will be the prisoners. But the thing is, they didn't tell them that they were prisoners yet. They told them a different story. So they told the prisoners to go home. And while the guards were getting on their gear, which, by the way, the guards were not taught anything. They weren't taught police work, anything. They just said, hey, you're the guard. Put on that robe. Do what you think a guard would do. And then um, the prisoners went home, and a real cop came and arrested the prisoner and took them to this facility. And that's where the experiment began. And ultimately, what ended up happening was there was riots. The prisoners were beginning to riot. The um, guards were beginning to do things that you would not imagine you would do. And there was even some person that had severe emotional distress. They were, it was as if they've been watching it on TV all the time, as if they've been listening to it all the time. They became what they never knew they would become. Now, the Milgram experiment, this is one that I really want to touch on. When I looked into it and researched it, it blew my mind. Um, it's a little complicated, so I have some paper here that I'm going to read. But what they were basically trying to do was test out, um, based off the World War II and the Germans doing the very evil cohort of things that they were doing, if it was just these particular people, or is this really, you know, the, the giving in the right conditions and listening to those who ordered them to do these heinous things, or was it actually any person that's sitting here, anyone that's outside, have the capability of doing it? So the psychologist's name was Stanley Milgram. He created an electric shock generator. So what that meant was there was 30 different switches ranging from 15 volts to 450 volts. And what um, occurred was uh, they would have to basically shock the other person if they got whatever the question they asked wrong. So of course, they didn't say this. Um, they just thought they were just doing a survey when they originally came. So um, the shock generator, well, the experimenter knew, but the subjects didn't know that the shock generator was in fact a phony. It would only produce a sound when the switches were pressed. So the experiment basically was to teach word pairs to the learner. When the learner made a mistake, the subject was instructed to punish the learner by giving him a shock. 15 volts higher for each mistake. So I'm just going to show you here um, how it works. You have the experimenter student right here. You have the teacher here and the experimenter right there. So what basically occurred was first they had two people um, in a room and they pulled a card. One person was going to be the experimenter or the student. No, not the experimenter, I'm sorry, just the student. And then the other person was going to be the teacher. The teacher delivers the shock. The student receives the shock. So what they didn't know was the student here, he was in on it, so to speak. So there was really no one getting a shock. 
but this teacher did not know this. They actually thought they were shocking a human being. So they also, in this experiment, were told that whether you leave or stay, you will still get paid. So it wasn't a matter of money. It was just a matter of what would they do. So here is the experimenter, and his role is basically to coerce the person to keep going. Because as you might imagine, this is a pretty scary thing. We're shocking someone, and it could possibly cause death. Actually, the last 435 to 450 volts were marked with an XXX, which means death. So they will go ahead and they will continue. Um, they start with one, and they would shock them and shock them. And now here was the interesting find that they got. They said, um, for how long will someone continue to give shocks to another person if they are told to do so, even if they thought they could be seriously hurt? That is the question they wanted to answer. And then to remember um, also that the person had met that, you know, we know is a stooge, but they didn't. So they wanted to show the fact that there is a possibility that that could be you sitting there. So they really wanted to get them to think on a personal level, like by chance it wasn't me sitting there. And so by doing that, they were hoping they would do, as we know, the right thing. But what actually happened was the learner, um, well, during the experiment, Stanley Milgram had um, the had many of the subjects show signs of tension. So it was a hard thing to do. But um, even though three subjects had full-blown, uncontrollable seizures, almost most subjects were, and almost most subjects were uncomfortable doing it, all 40 subjects obeyed up to 300 volts. 25 of the 40 subjects continued to complete to give shocks until the maximum level of 450 volts was reached. So they concluded, before the, the experiment, they really thought only one to three people, percent of the people, would stop giving shocks. But in actuality, 65% never stopped giving the shocks. So we now believe that it has to do with our almost innate behavior that we should do as told, especially from authority persons. So this is a big thing. This shows me how, though we might think later on, I'm okay, I, I got this, I, I have my salvation. No, God tells us, watch, lest you fall, because you can be that person that's ultimately telling someone, or, or pretty much bringing someone down because of what you've been told. We are not in control of ourselves. We think we are, but it's not. There's only two forces. There's God and there's Satan. And we have to decide for ourselves who is it that we're going to let control our lives. So this is one thing I wanted to show. Um, I don't know if everyone can see it, but what they had to do to make it realistic, because of course the other person didn't see this person strapped down to volts. They had a pre-recorded audio transcript. So with every volt, they had um, these things that are being said, and no matter what was said, the person still continued to give the volts. So like, for example, it says you're 150 volts. Um, uh, experimenter, that's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. Get me out of here, please. My heart's starting to bother me. I refuse to go on. Let me out. And then jumping to 180. I can't stand the pain, let me out of here. And then jumping to 195. Let me out of here, let me out of here, my heart's bothering me. Let me out of here, you have no right to keep me here. Let me out, let me out of here. Let me out, let me out of here. My heart's bothering me. Let me out, let me out. And then, continuing on, um, 270 volts, at this point they're screaming. Let me out of here, let me out of here. Do you hear me? Let me out of here. And then 300 volts. I absolutely refuse to answer anymore. Get me out of here. You can't hold me here. Get me out, get me out of here. 330 volts, intense and prolonged screaming. Let me out of here, my heart's bothering me. Let me out, I tell you. And they say, they're saying this hysterically. Let me out of here, let me out of here. You have no right to hold me here. Let me out, let me out. And I don't know how you all are feeling, but when I read this, I 
couldn't believe it. I, I can't even imagine being in that situation where I am being, you know, told this and I'm still pressing that button. I try to put myself in that place and ultimately each one of us can be there if we don't hold tight to God. And last, I found it very interesting. As you see, there's three different 450 volts, but there was silence. What they found is that people still pressed the button or, or, or flipped the switch to deliver the shock even when they heard nothing. So I can't even imagine that. That, that was just crazy to me. But what I want us to, to look at is that there is a crisis preparation that we need to, to get guard ourselves in. The true character is exposed in a crisis. And so we all know the upcoming crisis that's occurring. We all know what we need to do, what we need to gird on ourselves so that we can make it in the end. I found this um, interesting. Statistically, 10% of the people panic. 10% rise to the top and leave and 80% ask, what are we supposed to do? So of course we all know we want to be in that second 10%. We want to be the leaders. We want God to use us and glorify, and glorify Him through what we do each and every day so that we can be the people that rise to the top. Because if you think about it, we have the three more Hebrew boys. Was it easy for them to stand in the midst of all that was going to occur to them? Can you see yourself making that decision and standing out of the crowd? Or do you see yourself kneeling to the image and conforming because of all those around you? So, Jesus loves you. He wants you to trust him. James 4, 7-8 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. And then Fifth Testimonies, page 177 says, Cry unto the Lord, tempted soul. Cast yourself, helpless, unworthy, upon Jesus, and claim his very promise. The Lord will hear. He knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart, and he will help in every time of temptation. So we know that God is there for us. We have this knowledge, whether we knew it before or didn't, um, that God has a standard for us to live. And only by us living by that standard can we soon meet him in heaven. And one last thing. I know this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. There may be some that don't watch movies. There may be some that don't watch TV. They don't listen to music. But I want you to know the struggle of the heart. The purpose of this presentation was not just to expose the sins of the world, but to expose the sins of our heart. Watch ye and pray as ye enter into temptation. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. So though you may not do those things, you may not be watching a movie, so to speak, but are you replaying in your mind the scenes of the wrong another has done? You may not be playing video games, but are you playing out in your mind how you would deal with said person the way, the way that they deserve? Or you may not be listening to music, but, um, uh, well, ungodly music, but are you listening to another brother or another sister talk bad about someone else? So even though these specific topics may not apply to you, we have to search our hearts and find a deeper application to see if we are truly where the Lord will have us to be. So here is where I was going to talk a little about my testimony, but due to time, I cannot. Um, so moving on to the last slide here, I just want us to know that um, the Lord wants us to be free. He wants us to be um, blessed, happy, and at peace. I found that in my life, in just a small touch, I used to be the Netflix binger. I used to be the gamer. I used to do all of the things that I thought would bring me joy and bring me peace. But what I found was just the opposite, or it was just temporary. What I found that I was actually in bondage. You know, people may come to you and think maybe because of your diet that you're in bondage, but honestly, if you really think about it, we have that ability to make that choice. We make that choice because we love a God that made the ultimate choice for us. And those people who look at us and think they're, they're, they're enslaved, they're, they're brainwashed, they don't know. They don't know because there's the same person that has a cigarette 
while also having the hole in their throat because of cancer, but they can't stop smoking. Or the person that is doing drugs because it's the only way that they can have peace. Or it could be the person that can't watch, stop watching TV because of that dopamine high. So ultimately, we have to show the world that there is peace in Christ and that we can have ultimate, well not necessarily ultimate, but we can have um, um, we can abide in Christ, is what I want to say. And by abiding in Him, not only are we saved, but those around us can be saved. Amen. So I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to present your word. We thank you for all the great knowledge you have given to us, Lord. We thank you for the ability to make a choice. We are not forced by you. We are not enslaved. We are not held in bondage. And so we pray that in our lives we can be that testimony, Lord, that we can show others that living in you is joy and living in you is peace. For those who may be struggling with the addictions of the world, whether it be TV, games, or drugs, whatever it may be, anything that's not of you, I pray that you will lift it from them, Lord, and you will deliver them. Just as you can do it for me and each and every person in here, I pray you do it for all those who are enslaved and fooled by Satan. And I pray this in Jesus' name.